Good morning to those over in the fellowship hall and good morning to you on Facebook live stream or maybe you're watching this during the week. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We're glad you're here. We're transitioning back towards being together. And today what that means is there are about 15, 16, 17 folks here in the sanctuary, carefully spaced apart, wearing masks. And then there's some folks over at the fellowship hall doing likewise. We have room for you. We do. We have room over in the hall. Um, you can get here in the sanctuary if you sign up quick enough. Some did, some didn't. And uh, the way you do that is contact the church. There's a place on the website that you can do all of that good work. Uh, www.sharonumchurch.org. You'll see it right there. There's also on the website a place for uh, prayer requests. And we welcome that. Our intercessory prayer team meets every week. We lift up the prayers as they come to us uh, during the week, and come to us on Sunday morning. Uh, we encourage you to lift up the prayers. Uh, we believe God changes circumstances and situations. God moves because his people pray. And we want you to be part of that. And yes, there's a place there that you can electronically give to the ministry and mission of the church. We've not slowed down. Uh, we've just changed our routine. For the, those here, there's an offering plate uh, in the back of the church on your way out. In fact, I want to announce something very exciting, and that's in the uh, bulletin. You'll see it on the Facebook page, or on the, well, it's on Facebook page, it's uh, on the website, it's everywhere. Uh, we're getting ready to give away 1,100 boxes of uh, dairy products. That working with another nonprofit, uh, we've stumbled onto the opportunity to give free a uh, box of a couple gallons of milk, uh, chocolate milk's in there, some cottage cheese, sour cream. Nice package. We're going to do it out here in our parking lot in late October. Uh, we're starting. We need two things right now. We need a little bit of money. Somebody gave uh, a gift, a matching gift, and uh, it announces that. And we just need a little bit of fundraising. That's what the offering envelope's about. And uh, that's what it looks like. We also need volunteers. Uh, the only condition is that each box weighs 22 pounds. So you got to be comfortable picking up. It'll be on a pallet, picking it up, putting it into a car. So we're going to talk more about that in the days ahead. We're excited about this opportunity. It's coming to Manchester, free dairy. And uh, we know a lot of people could uh, benefit from that. We want to participate in blessing others and in return receive a blessing as we do that. Uh, there are some other things, and we try to, uh, I think that pastor's pondering somehow got in the bulletin. I'm not sure why, but uh, it's talking about this event about being together in worship. It's good. It's good. I think uh, Jan Harris was uh, playing a little pre-music, uh, pre-worship music. Uh, there's some issues uh, with Facebook Live about music, and so we're, we're going to try to work those details out if this goes very much further. Uh, we're glad you're here. We know God's got something for you. We're going to talk. We're working our way through 1 Corinthians. Uh, it's going to be a long slog. We're up to chapter 6 today, though. And we're going to talk about uh, what is the body for? Paul wants to talk about that. And I've got a... Do you have a toolbox at home? Maybe you have a... Well, if you're like me, you might have one for the inside of the house and one in the garage and one somewhere else. And there's probably one in the car and there's one everywhere, it seems like. And you know what it is about toolboxes? They never have the tool you really want at the moment, it seems like. We're going to talk about that. that. That's the teaser. Are you ready for worship? We're glad you're here. This is the day the Lord has made. Come, let us worship. I invite you to uh, have your bulletin open and to join with me in this uh, call to worship. It comes to us from Psalm 139. Oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You're familiar with all my ways. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. How 
precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. When I awake, I am still with you. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Amen and amen. I'm trying to pull up. But it's not there. Hang on. I've got a prayer. Every morning, uh, every day, usually every morning and then again quite often in the evening, I follow a pattern of private devotion. It comes from a website called MethodistPrayer.org. It follows the daily order. Right? So uh, this is morning prayer, noon prayer, evening prayer, night prayer. And so this morning, uh, I want to use this. It always begins the same way, with a prayer of thanksgiving to God. So let us pray. Blessed are you, sovereign God, creator of all. To you be glory and praise forever. You founded the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. In the fullness of time, you made us in your image and in and in these last days, you've spoken to us in your Son, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. As we rejoice in the gift of your presence among us, let the light of your love always shine in our hearts. Your Spirit ever renew our lives, and your praises ever be on our lips. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. We turn our attention to uh, God's Word and found uh, this morning in two places. We're reading from uh, Romans 6 and then we said from 1 Corinthians. Let us pray further as we uh, open our ears and our minds to receive God's Word. Lord, come upon us, Holy Spirit. Come and, and, then, and do, do just that. Open our ears that we can listen, our minds to comprehend, our hearts to receive the message you have for our life this very day. For we ask it in Christ Jesus. Amen. Romans 6, uh, starting at verse 8. Paul's writing, he says, Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master, because you're not under law, but under grace. What then, he asks, shall we sin because we're not under law, but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, whether you're slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God, that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching in which you were entrusted. You've been set free from sin, and you've become slaves to righteousness. Um, I, that's the setup. That, I want you to keep that in the back of your mind, what you just heard from St. Paul there at Romans. He's going to say something similar here to the Corinthian church in chapter 6, starting at verse 12. He says, look, to the Corinth church, he says, everything, everything's permissible for me. But not everything's beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I'll not be mastered by anything. Food for the stomach, the stomach for food. But God, in the end, destroys them both. The body's not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead. He will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that 
He who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body, for it's said from Genesis 2, the two will become one flesh. But those who unite themselves with the Lord, they are one with him in spirit. So flee, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, who's in you, whom you have received from God? You're not your own. You were brought, bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So all of the sexual immorality, so we've been, we've been listening uh, to Paul's letter to the Corinth. This is actually the second letter. We don't know because he references uh, just some verses back from where I picked up the reading that he had previously written to them. And so this is at least the second letter, and he'll go on to write a third letter to them. This is the church he founded or, or he established in Corinth. He spent uh, 18 months there building that church, getting that faith community together. Corinth, as we heard in previous weeks, was a, a very cosmopolitan. Um, it was a port city. It had a lot of folks uh, coming and going with a lot of different views on how to uh, behave, and there are lots of temples there. Uh, as you can imagine, it's, it's a, a Roman city. And so this whole issue uh, that he's talking about here with sexual immorality, something has happened in the church. And in fact, uh, if we were to go back uh, just a chapter, what we find out has happened is that there's a man in the church who's been sleeping with his stepmother. And it's not a secret. Everybody knows it, and everybody pretty much goes, ah, so what? Paul says, so what? And then through chapter 5 and chapter 6, and so that little bit, I, that's the setup for this part of the letter. Paul says, so what? Let me tell you so what. But I, was, I, I got this... Uh, I got my object lesson. Jack, you didn't yell at me. You said, preacher, you didn't like the candles. I bet you they lit them over at the fellowship hall. <laughs> this is what happens when you're uh, thinking too fast. Uh, you have your permission, uh, if you need it, to yell at the preacher periodically. Like, we're not doing that. You've skipped over something in the bulletin. They're known to do that, too. You know why we light these candles? We light them because they remind us God's present, that Jesus is fully divine and fully human. Forgive me, the preacher forgot for a moment. You probably would have let me go on the whole time. All right. You have a toolbox? I have a toolbox. This is one of many toolboxes. Somehow... Somewhere along the line, I started collecting toolboxes. I'm not sure why. Um, it's probably because I moved a few times and uh, I couldn't find a toolbox and I found tools, so I, I bought a new box. And this one's pretty new, it's still it's got a sticker on there. Uh, I have a toolbox that I guess I inherited. I don't know. I think my brothers, uh, when my parents died, I think my brother, all my brothers had toolboxes and they said, I don't want that. So I have one that way, and in it, I don't even know what's in that toolbox. I think there's an electric drill. I, don't, I have no idea. Um, but the most frustrating thing is when you open it, you're looking for something, and you open up the toolbox, and you go, oh. But the nice thing is that in all my toolboxes, uh, while I might not have a hammer, there's no hammer. But there's always something. There's always something that could be used as a hammer. And it really doesn't matter what. It just needs to be metal and it needs to be heavy. And, uh, and it works. It works. But that's not really its intended purpose. There's, I, I have a toolbox. I know in one toolbox, at least I know that I used to have it. Now I may have, I don't know. Because in that toolbox, there's a kitchen knife. 
Now, I mean like a kitchen knife that you put on the table. I'm not saying how I came about having that dining room knife in my toolbox, but I suspect it was because I needed a screwdriver. <laughs> and I couldn't find them. And I found that this worked. And, and it worked. It worked not just once, it worked many times. And so I kept it in my toolbox. And then one time it didn't work so good and snap, and I broke the tip off. So I'm not telling somebody that when she says, hey, you know, we used to have that old dinner knife that was kind of like not really matching up with any of the other dinner knives. I said, I have no idea where it went. Using something for the wrong purpose creates problems. You can use it that way. That did or not, quite frankly, even with a broken tip, it's a really good flat-headed screwdriver. But as a dinner knife, not so. So the reading from 1 Corinthians 6. It's asking this question, so what is a body for? What's the body for? The whole part of this section that I read is about learn, for us to learn how to use the human body the right way, for the right purposes. So Paul quotes a real popular slogan or a, a tagline that was popular in Corinth in those days, everything's permissible. Not everything's beneficial. Food for the stomach, the stomach for the food. Now, the Greek philosophers that were in the rage at the time looked down, they, they looked down on the physical body. They said, what's a body for? One said, uh, and I'll try to, I don't know how to read this Greek name, Epi somebody. But he said, the body's a tomb. I'm a poor soul shackled to a corpse. Well, that's a cheery thought. What's more important? What's more important, they said, that the only thing that mattered, the only thing that really mattered to Greeks thought was your spirit, your soul. The body, eh, it didn't matter. It just housed this soul that was so important. And so it was the Greeks that separated the body from the soul. So in Corinth, they were seemingly were prone, the folks were prone to such thoughts and actions that flowed from this view, right? And since, since the body was something that really in the end didn't matter all that much, you could do what you liked with it. Everything is permissible. I can do what I like. Not that you've ever heard anybody say anything like this. Moral rules? Come on. What age are you living in? Those are for other people. I'm a free agent. I'm not beholden to anyone. My body, my choice. I can do what I want. Or, in Corinth, when Paul was writing, the stomach is for food. And food is for the stomach. I mean, it makes sense, right? Food and stomach, they go together. It just makes sense. The argument is something like this. Look. God, God made the body for certain instincts. And so it's right that, that I follow them. If I'm thirsty, I drink. If I'm hungry, I eat. Sexual activity, the body's made for that. And so what I do is I let my body, I let the desires of the body have their way. Everything is permissible. But not everything's beneficial. Just to add, in uh, Eugene Peterson, in his translation of, of these verses, 12 and 13, he writes, just because something is technically legal doesn't mean that it's spiritually appropriate. If I went around doing whatever I thought I could get by with, then I'd be a slave to my whims. Yeah, you know what? Uh, them nippers, and I like them. This, my friends, is a hammer. Don't let me tell you any different. But I found out a hammer doesn't work at all for nippers. That doesn't work right, right? 
That kitchen knife. Oh, that table knife works very good. Very good as a screwdriver. But when you sit down and you use it for its intended purpose, not so. So Paul's argument here, and he'll make this argument much more extensively over in his letter that he wrote to the Galatian church, right? Is that when we follow Jesus, we're given freedom. There's freedom in Christ. That we're set free from the past. We're set free from all the things that have shackled us into a place that we can just, it's predictable what's going to happen. We're set free from that, he says. It's important that nothing, he says, it's important that nothing be allowed to give me orders. Not my stomach, not bodily instinct, not appetite, not habit, not the surrounding atmosphere of the culture that influences me, that pressures me towards a certain style of living, of doing things. Paul doesn't, Paul doesn't doubt our ability to do many things with our bodies. That's not, but he, the question he's asking is, where does it lead to? Are you just being driven by your biology? Or will you think it through? Will you start asking questions? If I do this, will it draw me closer to God? Will it, will it help build up faith? Do I have mastery over my habits? Or, or am I enslaved to them? We're given a body by God. And taking care of this body is one way to, that we demonstrate our allegiance, our trust, our faith in God, who helps us take care of this flesh. Obviously, he thought I don't need much hair products, but just saying. <laughs> Look, Paul doesn't deny that we're given stomachs for food and sexual organs for those purposes as well. But he does deny, and he denies very strongly that the purpose, that this purpose is fulfilled by any and every sexual expression. That's the point. Sex is good. God designed this for sexual expression. And so, next chapter, I think it's the next chapter, he's going to speak about marriage. But here, here, he's pointing out the thought that, that any sexual practice that takes someone's fancy, is it as good as any other? Is that what he's asking? What's a body for? Does God have an, an intention for the body? Is it for, for us to satisfy in whatever way we can, or, or is there something more to be accomplished with our physical self? Well, the answer is, what's the body meant for? It's meant for the Lord. Our bodies are created to be in a living relationship with God. It, it's not, we're created not just for a spiritual relationship, but in fact, also a physical one. Physical. Physical in the sense that, that Jesus wants to know us. Right? He wants to know us. And even more so, he wants to work in and through us. He wants to work in our minds, yes, is to help us influence our thinking. He wants to work in our soul and draw us into the everlasting and ever-living relationship with the Creator. He wants to work with our bodies as we seek to, as we seek to serve our neighbor. Verse 14. Oh, all right. Since God honors you with the body, then the question is, so then honor God with your body. That'd be the shorthand. Verse 14, by his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Raise us. Raise us. Remember the creed? I believe in God the Father Almighty, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, who died, and who was raised. How was he raised? We're going to hear more about that, a lot more about that when we get to chapter 15. He was raised a physical body. A physical body. The resurrection. 
If we're going to be raised with Christ as Christ was raised, you get it, right? I'm hammering it. We get raised a physical body. And so it matters what we do with our bodies. Our bodies have a sacred purpose. And that purpose is to honor God. To say it another way. To be holy as God is holy. The resurrection of the body remains a mystery. This is N.T. Wright, the commentator, the preacher, he's everything. He says the resurrection of the body remains a mystery. We don't have the language to do justice to what it finally means. But it certainly means that there'll be some sort of continuity between the present body and the future one. What we do with our bodies here and now matters to then and there. We're not given free reign to do whatever we want with our bodies. And again, in this context, if Paul's talking about to the Corinth church, and it may be very contemporary, particularly when it comes to sexual expression. Paul is encouraging the church in Corinth to think about what are you doing? What's driving your behavior? And what are the consequences? that are involved. I mean, Paul could have given one of those, thou shalt not, you know, you ever hear a preacher say that? Thou shalt not do this then. You know, like I, look, you take it or leave it. And so, a lot of people just say, hmm, I'm not taking that, so I guess I'll leave. There's a time for law. But, but in a principle, if a principle is given to help one think through the issue, might not that have a greater impact rather than just saying, think about, I don't know if you've raised children, but maybe it was your father, maybe it was your mother. Did they tell you, don't do that? Well, sure they did at times. But I also suspect, as with my family, that there were principles laid out. I, I tell this story frequently. So I was raised in a house where uh, I made the mistake one day. My father was a professor at the university. And I made the mistake one day of saying, uh, that foreigner, is he coming again? And uh, the question was legit, but not the word foreigner. My father, here's the principle. He said, the only foreign thing is when I take the cup from you and I notice there's something in it that doesn't belong. That's form. The principle is you welcome the stranger. And the person, the person that you meet, if you don't know their name, don't be so lazy as to ignore it. Meet, you know, find out who they are, where they're from. They look different, talk different. Wow, what an adventure. You belong to Jesus. You. What part of you belongs to Jesus? What part? Your whole self. Thank you. Your whole self. And your whole self is made up of what? How should I love the Lord my God? I shall love the Lord the God, my God with my heart, heart my soul, my soul my and my body. My mind. My mind. Body, mind, and spirit, body, mind, and soul. All of you belongs to Jesus. What you do with your mind, right? The attitude you develop, the thoughts that come through your gray matter, right? They challenge. You, you need to challenge your thinking or, or to accept this thought. But all of it matters to God. For from out of our thoughts, out of the attitudes that develop from our thinking, they lead to our actions. If we develop a certain idea that I can do anything with my body, you know, I mean, okay, maybe the principle, as long as it doesn't hurt me or hurt someone else, it, and if my culture sanctions it, then why give it another thought? What we do with our bodies follows our thoughts and attitudes. What we do sexually, is it done only to your body, Paul's asking? Body, mind, what we do sexually, we do with our whole self, all of us, not just some small piece of the whole. 
So he uses the illustration for Mary. What you are and what you do as a follower of Christ, you do with your whole self including the spiritual part, but also including the physical part. And so lastly, lastly here in this section, Paul is, is focusing us back, focusing us back always, back to the spirit that works in us, and back to the cross of Jesus. Do you not know your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit that's in you, whom you've received from God? And then he says, you're not your own. You were bought at a price. The temple in Jerusalem is where God resided. So where's God living now? In you. In you. Through the gift of the Holy Spirit. A gift. A gift given to you that you might always and everywhere know the living promise of God. The Spirit comes to make these promises known of peace and joy, of love and hope. You're not your own. You were bought with a price. I, I, yeah, you can, you can reject the gift that God's given. You can grieve the Spirit, as Paul would write in Ephesians 4. But you can't, you can't just suddenly one day say, Hey, Holy Spirit, I, I want to go over there and do something. Could you like take a vacation for a couple days? It doesn't work that way. Likewise, you can never stop being a child of God. Right? You've been bought. A child of God who's been redeemed, who's been bought with a price, and the price was paid to, to save you, to, to redeem you, to bring you out of that slavery to sin and death. In fact, on the cross, Jesus paid the price with his own life, his own blood, to rescue, rescue and redeem all of humanity. You know, sinners. Big sinners, small sinners, great sinners, little sinners, all. What is a body for? A body, a gift from God, a place where God resides with us. It's given that we might honor God. And so I close with these words from N.T. Wright, again in his commentary on 1 Corinthians. He says, honor God. In other words, discover how to live truly human life. A life that brings glory to the God who's who in glory to the God who's uh, I can't say that word which brings glory to the God in whose image you are made and and whose own unique image his son Jesus died to rescue you rescue you from all that will stop you from being the person that God longs for you to be Have you asked that question lately? Of late? I don't know. It's, it's a question that sometimes we, we focus more on during Lent. But it's a good question to ask all the time. Is there something, is there something that's stopping me from being the person that Jesus wants me to be? Some thought that's gone unexamined too long. Some attitude that I've harbored. Some activity of my body that and I just have said, you know, I'm just going to pretend the Holy Spirit's up, up north. Good news. The good news is that today, today with the living presence of God here, you can begin anew. And so we summarize it, right, in these four words, that God and direct our, our activity, guide and direct our ministry and our mission. They're, they're words, but they're also attitudes. They're also prayers. They're, it's the way that we're orienting ourselves. Come. Come. Part, uh, follow Jesus. Follow Him. Come and partner with God through worship and prayer. Come. God wants a partner in the activity. And what's the activity? To serve our neighbor. To serve the community together. A body, oh, let me tell you, a body is made to honor God. Thanks be to God. Amen? Amen. Amen. We have a time to respond to God uh, through our prayers, and uh, we are uh, uh, 
we produce, uh, the intercessory prayer team produces, this is just one little page. Uh, there are multiple pages that we use. Uh, we're constantly asking God to uh, intervene and intercede. You see at the bottom of, of the back of the bulletin, it says, Today, please pray for. And these summarize much of what the intercessory prayer team has come to. It's not all, because we know that the Holy Spirit works in us and brings to mind at certain moments names and circumstances, situations that just need, just need someone to ask God to intervene. So let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this day that you've made and you made it that we might gather as your people and gather together in worship. We thank you, God, that even later this afternoon there's a group that will, will gather to pray more work of yours, to give thanks, to intercede, to say, Lord, Lord, of all the places you're going to focus your love and your hope, please hear. Do that here. Lord, we are bodies placed in real time and in real places. And there are places in the world that need your attention. Places of great conflict. Places that are undergoing great tensions. Leaders. Some lead their people with effectiveness, others do not. Tensions between nations. Lord, there are places places in our country that need your attention. They need with your wisdom to come upon the leaders. Lord, we need courageous leaders in these days, and so we, we ask, Lord, to lift them up, to protect them, to guide them. And Lord, we pray, we pray this day for your church. It goes by many names on many corners throughout the world. We think of those that we're related to, especially down in Nisak, Haiti, or Luigi in the DRC in the Congo. Lord, would you bless them this week? The task that you've given to them, the partnerships we have with them, would you bless those places? Would you bless our brothers and sisters? But elsewhere, Lord, elsewhere, your church, would you bless your church? And would you work through your church to manifest the hope for the world and for love to conquer all? Lord, we pray for those battling fires and floods in our nation and around the world, those who, who are on rescue missions, those who are, who are just trying to protect property, some, Lord, that have given their life doing that. We pray for families who have suffered loss. The grief that grips them. The grief that seems at times it will not let go. Lord, we pray especially uh, for Paul Whelan in a Russian prison. Lord, that working through our politicians, their politicians, working in whatever way, Lord, you find necessary, that your sovereign will be done, that Paul would be released from that prison. His family would know, know his friendship, and his companionship. Lord, that he would come home. We pray for our sister Lynn and all of those who are struggling with health issues. We pray, Lord, for your healing. And we pray for your peace. We pray, Lord, to be so present that the one that the, the one who's approaching the darkness of death would keep their eyes focused on Jesus and, until all that they see is Jesus. And they see you face to face as you welcome them home. So, Lord, we pray for those that you led us to pray for in this hour. We ask, Lord, for your intercessions and for your consolations. We ask, Lord, for you to come and come with power and come with mercy, to come in compassion, to come bestowing your peace. We ask this because of Christ Jesus 
And it's in his name we pray, the same name uh, for when we did not know how to pray, he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen and amen. We have a way of responding beyond our worship and our prayers to what God is doing. It's through the offering plate, and it does provide for all kinds of mission and ministry. Um, as I said previously, we're not, we've slowed down, we've had hiccups like everybody has, but we're finding places where God invites us to be engaged with our community. We're thankful for that. And so we talked about that earlier. I hope you'll check out uh, the face, uh, our Facebook feed and the website's important. We're trying to keep that updated and, and good information there. Uh, brats and uh, dogs are coming here in another two. Friday. 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 Yeah. Where am I? Yeah. What day is this? <laughs> Friday. So I, uh, uh, George Wacker and what's his wife's name? Lois. Lois. They were at the mailbox. I caught them. <laughs> Lois said, do I need to buy a ticket? I said, no, I'll just drive around. So, uh, so I think there's two more if we were expecting some. But, uh, we're, uh, we're excited about that. And for the ladies, it's uh, dinner, right? You see our sign? We're, we're going to post a sign. Have we posted that sign on our Facebook page? Well, I'm sure my technician over here <laughs> will, will do it soon. <laughs> like today. <laughs> why, why you have that body and that mind? <laughs> All right. Maybe I should get out. Well, thank you for being here. Uh, we do invite you to, uh, uh, we'll announce, I, I don't know what day it will be, probably Wednesday, that we'll put the link out, we'll send it out to everybody. Um, there's room for people to come and worship. But we do, we're going to do this for a few more weeks as, so things straighten out a little further. And uh, we'll see where we go from there. Thank you to those over the fellowship hall. I hope the technology's worked and everything has gone well. Receive now this benediction. May the peace of Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen.